Will you join me in our call to worship? To those who sit in darkness, light has gone. God's glorious presence has appeared. God is leading our life and our salvation. We will follow unafraid where God and Jesus lead us. Let us worship our God in light and promise. Let us celebrate the hope and joy of our salvation. Let us pray. God of light and love, we come this morning with eyes steaming from the brightness of your glory. We have become so accustomed to the darkness that your radiant light sometimes overwhelms us. Open our eyes to the light of your dawn, that our souls may be flooded with love and mercy and joy. Open our hearts to receive your message of comfort and peace and security, that we might find rest in your loving, protected presence. Open our spirits to follow the path you put before us, that we may lead lives committed to your way. Amen. Now let us stand and sing Jesus Calls Us. So I know what I was doing 38 years ago today. I was at Texas Women's Hospital uh, having my firstborn. Today is his birthday. So for our, um, uh, as we pass the piece, we have a lot of August birthdays in here, and I hope you will find them. So will you turn to each other and pass the peace of Christ? <laughs>
good, bad, and ugly. Matthew also in that first chapter redefines the term righteous. Righteous is a very Jewish word, and it means to follow the law. So the Pharisees were considered to be righteous. But Matthew redefines righteousness. That following the law is not always the righteous path. And in the example of Joseph, he calls Joseph righteous. Not because he followed the law, because he didn't, but because he put an element of compassion in what he did. In chapter 2, we have the wonderful story of the Magi. We have uh, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph leaving Bethlehem quickly and escaping to Egypt. And then when they return at the death of Herod, instead of returning back to Bethlehem, which would be normal, they went to Nazareth, which was up in Galilee in the northern kingdom. In chapter 3, we have the introduction of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is doing a repentance baptism. In other words, a baptism for the repentance of sins. And he's out in the River Jordan, people are coming to him, and he's telling them to get ready. That someone else is coming. And that someone else finally shows up and asks John to baptize him. And John's sitting there going, no, I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus tells him, no, this is to fulfill righteousness. There's that word again. And what Jesus is doing in his baptism is redefining baptism for the rest of us. Baptism is no longer a baptism for the repentance of sins. Baptism is also with water and the Spirit, and it is a redefinition of our identity. We put that text with the beginning of chapter 4 where Jesus goes into temptation and indeed we see those temptations that Jesus went through, the same temptations that we as Christians face today, the same temptations that even God's church faces today. And what is that? Well, we can use our gifts and our graces for the spectacular, miraculous events and gain attention that way. Or we can uh, use our gifts and become celebrities. Or we can use the influence of the church and our spiritual gifts to gain power in the kingdoms of this world. In other words, we can use our uh, the resources of the church for politics. And Jesus resists all of those. Today we're going to talk about discipleship, which is the calling of the church to make disciples who make disciples for the transformation of the world. Today we will hear Jesus launch his earthly ministry, and we will hear him call his first disciples. Now, when we started our study on Matthew, I suggested that uh, you look for three identifiers that are unique to Matthew. One is the word righteousness that we've already talked about. And we've already seen it used a couple of times. We're going to start seeing it more often. Second is, but the third is the language of kingdom. We've only seen it a couple of times. We're going to start seeing it a lot. Because Jesus speaks in kingdom language. For Jesus, the idea of kingdom, whether he calls it kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven, is not some abstract idea. The term kingdom is actually revealed and embodied 
and the ministry and the life of Jesus. So we're in the fourth chapter beginning with verse 12. Now when Jesus heard that John was arrested, he went to Galilee. He left Nazareth and settled in Capernaum, which lies alongside the sea in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. This fulfilled what Isaiah the prophet said. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, along the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. And the people who lived in the dark have seen a great light. And a light has come upon those who lived in the region and in the shadow of death. From that time, Jesus began to announce, Change your hearts and lives. Here comes the kingdom of heaven. As Jesus walked alongside the Galilee Sea, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, throwing fishing nets into the sea because they were fishermen. Come follow me, he said, and I'll show you how to fish for people. Right away, they left their nets and followed him. Continuing on, he saw another set of brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, repairing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Jesus traveled throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. He announced the good news of the kingdom and healed every disease and sickness among the people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. May your scripture always be our delight, O Lord. May we not be deceived in them or deceived by them. Amen. Eric Larson is an author of eight books, six of which are New York Times bestsellers. He writes narrative nonfiction. In other words, he tells a story about some event in the past. One of his most popular books was about the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. He talked about, uh, one of his books talked about the hurricane that destroyed Galveston Island. And one of his more recent books, he talks about America's first ambassador to Nazi Germany and the experience of him and his daughter in Germany. My preaching professor, Alice McKenzie, was a big fan of Eric Larson. But, and she's attended many, many of his lectures, which are always packed. But in the beginning, that wasn't so. It took him a while to get a fan base. After the publishing of his first book, his publicist did what publicists usually do. She set him up on a book tour in major cities. And so in this one particular city, he walks out to this huge auditorium to speak, and it's empty. There's one lady there. And she was sitting on the back row. I'm not going to pick on you back row people today. So he thanked her for coming. And he suggested that uh, she might want to move up so they could have more of a conversation and make eye contact. And she calls out to him, no, thank you. I'll stay put. I may want to leave early. <laughs> Friends, this is the biggest problem in the Christian church today. How do we engage people in genuine discipleship so they don't just slip out the back door. We know it happens all the time before COVID. And after COVID, it's become even more apparent because a lot of folks just haven't come back. And it's not us. 
We see this everywhere. If you look on vital signs, you see that most churches are worshiping about half of what they did before the pandemic started. Many people have gotten used to worshiping online, and they kind of like that. I've had people tell me, yes, before y'all were on Facebook on a regular, I, I spent my Sunday mornings with Pulaski Heights and what I call Moo Moo Church. I've even visited with some of our members, and they tell me, you know, Beth, I really enjoy sitting in my pajamas with my cup of coffee and watching the service. So, many churches have taken a different approach. And perhaps we should do that as well after COVID. They have gone through what we call a next steps program to look at where you are and to engage you in a way that you draw closer and closer and closer to God, which means you won't slip out the back way. While Jesus doesn't outline this specifically, if you look at his engagement with his disciples, you can see him continually taking them to the next step and inviting them to come closer. In the Gospel of Matthew, we see this big teaching piece that we're about to reach, that we've done before, called the Sermon on the Mount. And he goes from there teaching them the basics and then take steps by steps takes them further until he actually sends them out on their own. Jesus doesn't launch his own ministry until he heard that John the Baptist has been arrested. And when that happens, he leaves Nazareth. He leaves his mom. And he moves not closer to Jerusalem, but further away. He moves about 40 miles northeast to the fishing village of Capernaum which is right on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Now, Capernaum is still there. And, and if you go, you can walk the steps that probably Jesus walked on. The original synagogue is still there, although it's been destroyed by earthquakes. But they built upon built upon built, and so you can actually see at the bottom and the foundation, the stones of the foundation where Jesus preached. And you can walk the steps thinking Jesus may have walked these very steps. And you can walk along the seashore. Jesus encountered four fishermen that day. Simon Peter and his brother Andrew. And he told them to follow him. And they would make them fishers of people. And they drop their nets and they follow. And then here's James and John sitting in the boat with their father mending their nets. And Jesus tells them to follow them. And they drop their nets and leave their dad and get out of the boat and follow Jesus. They stay with Jesus for three years. Capernaum was headquarters where they lived. And it's no doubt that they used their boats when they did ministry all around the Sea of Galilee. When you see that Jesus has gone to the other side of the sea, they're probably in one of their boats. Jesus engages with them in a way that draws them closer. Early in the church, they had a three-year program as well to become a disciple. You had to enter into this program, a three-year process, before you were baptized. One of the great things about Methodism, 
was John Wesley resurrected a discipleship program to draw you closer and closer to God, where people would engage, where they would become more involved. But somewhere between the 18th century and the 20th century, it became less about this process, and a lot of people have simply walked out the back door. So a lot of churches have gone about designing a program of engagement where you can actually follow and, and get closer and know where your next step is. Know where you are and know where you need to go next. Uh, I did one that was for mature disciples uh, trying to get engaged deeper and one called Connected in Christ by Jim and Molly Scott, which I've talked about. But other churches have lost beginning courses. In some, there's a course called Alpha that is very popular and is used. It is not United Methodist Theology, so it teaches a few things that we don't believe, like women shouldn't be up here. <laughs> But it's been highly successful, and a lot of Methodist churches have used it and just adapted those parts. James Harness, uh, 10 years ago, wrote a book called Disciples Path that kind of laid out a plan. And Church of the Resurrection, which is one of the largest United Methodist Church, their education team decided to come up with a plan called Journey 101, that would help people, uh, especially people new to Christ or people that had been fully engaged in the church, to learn and become more involved. Now, every single one of these courses has some kind of core essentials that you should find in all uh, fully mature Christians. I've used the ones from Journey 101, and it's in your bulletin today. And so I hope, instead of just throwing your bulletin on the back table and walking out, that you'll actually take it home and, and look at that list and kind of think about where you might be engaged. Now, if you listen to the podcast, I went over them step by step, but that's a lot of, that's a lot of talking. So I just want to give you the highlights. They broke them into three categories, and the first one is knowing God. So a lot of people that come to the church and they sit on that back row because they don't really, they're really not sure who God is. And coming to know God involves getting to know what this uh, auditorium we're in is all about. So it's knowing the essentials of the faith. And the essentials of the faith can be found in our creeds in the back of your hymnal. Uh, the Apostles' Creed that we recite every Sunday except Communion Sunday. The Nicene Creed. You'll see all kind of creeds in the back of your uh, hymnal. The creeds were fences to separate what would be called Orthodox Christianity from other things. The Stoics started liking Christianity. The Gnostics started trying to like Christianity. And there's a lot of New Age stuff out there that I don't call New Age. I call it old heresy. But the creeds kind of set a fence of what is orthodox and what we believe. There's basic Bible understanding. There's the understanding of what the church is. And as you come to know these things and you're comfortable with them and you come to see the body of Christ as being the body of Christ, then you, you start seeing the teachings and learning how to use your Bible and how to apply that to the ethics of your own lives. You learn how to discern. That is knowing God. And as you get to know God, maybe you come a little bit closer and engage. To know God is to love God. 
So when you reach the point that you realize what God has done for you and you really begin to love and engage with God, you're willing to surrender your life. You're willing to submit to this process of transformation where you start to see the fruits of the Spirit taking place in your own life. You start engaging authentically with other Christians. So the body of Christ isn't just a place that you come and have casual relationships. The body of Christ, and especially maybe your Sunday school class or a small group, you get into the nitty-gritty of life. We get into the nitty-gritty of life and doing it with the children. We had a great discussion this morning on the Beatitudes and what each one of them meant in our daily life. So you start talking in authentic language, things that matter. And let me tell you, when you start talking about things that matter and you start seeing a transformation in your own life, you're moving closer and closer to God, which means you're very unwilling to leave early and sneak out the back. So as you come to know God and you come to love God, then you want to find a way to serve God. And to really serve God, you become engaged. You find out what your spiritual gifts are, what your talents are, and maybe you join the choir, or maybe you work in our food pantry, or maybe you're a volunteer with Sue's Table. But you find a way to serve. Our children are acolytes. <clears throat> How do you start serving God in a way? Or maybe you get involved with a justice issue. Or maybe you get involved with something that's going on in our community. But we use the gifts we have to build up the body of Christ. And that's not just our talents. And that's not just our gifts of the Spirit. But that's our financial resources. And that's our time. So when the lay leadership calls you and says, I, I really would like you to serve here, you don't, I don't have time. You understand that your time is precious, but it's also precious to the difference you can make here. So as we look at these four disciples and the other eight, they didn't stay on the back row. Over that three years, they got closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. Closer. And they thought they were there until Jesus died and they scattered. And they came back and they rose to the occasion. And they did more than just sit in a pew. They actually got up and took over the microphone and began sharing the good news themselves. This is what we're working towards here. Having authentic relationships with each other and with God. Helping as a congregation to help you find a way to become more engaged. And, and we're trying to do that in a multitude of ways. And so I hope when you take that list home and you look at it and, and you see that, well, I'm really kind of here, but I haven't made a transition to this next step. Then let's have a conversation about how we can move you closer. How we can help you develop the spiritual discipline or, or how we can make this more meaningful to your life. Not just on Sunday morning, but every day of the week. Because we don't want anyone to leave early or slip out the door. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
God, we have come together to refocus our priorities and to become more alert to your actions in our lives. We come together to find new joy in all the ways you have blessed us. And we come together seeking your direction in ways that might break down the barriers we've created among ourselves and against you so that others may be drawn to your life-saving love. Finally, we come to hear again the summons of Jesus, follow me. We ask that we might be led in ways where we might proclaim the gospel of your realm in our daily life. We recommit to you all of ourselves, our devotion, our time, our talents, and our commitment to faithful service. For you bring light into our darkness. You increase our joy. You ease our burdens. And so in faith we set those burdens before you that you might lighten the yoke on our shoulders. We place before you our fragmented, busy lives. Teach us that we need not to depend on our doing and having for a sense of worth. We place before you our friends, the hurt, the addicted, the sorrowing, the struggling, the frustrated, and those in fragile marriages. Teach us the sacrament of care as we reach out to others in acts of love. We place before you our church. Teach us the way of trust and compassion and empower us to share the story of our faith where we live and work. We place before you our broken world, a world yearning for justice and freedom. Teach us the paths of peace and give us a brighter vision and hope for the future. And so, loving God, we open ourselves this day to your ceaseless outpouring of love. We awake each day to your presence, and when we are anxious or troubled, you comfort us. When we are faced with difficult choices that confuse us, you are there to guide us. You have surrounded us with your love before we even turn to you. May we in turn follow you as a faithful disciple our whole life long. Amen. Christ invites those to come to this table. Who know him. Who earnestly seek repentance and seek to live in peace with one another. On the night he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, and he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, broken for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Eat this, and when you do, remember me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup of blessing, and he gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink this. It is my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this, and when you do, remember me. And so, in remembrance of these God's mighty acts through Jesus Christ, we come to offer our own lives as a whole and living sacrifice in union with what Christ has done for us. Let us pray. Pour out your spirit on these gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Make us one in your spirit, one in ministry with each other and one in ministry to the world until one day we can come in great joy and glory and feast at your heavenly banquet. Now all glory, power, honor, majesty is yours now and forever. And now, with boldness, let us pray the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would those serving please come forward? <clears throat> These are the gifts of God for the children of God come feast at God's table.
dedication. I have decided to follow Jesus, and it's in the little Black Faith and Scene book, 2129. Amen. Amen. 